Hey guys, I'm Joe from Joe Spins the Globe and I hope you enjoyed my video fly through of the South Pole Station. If you haven't seen that video yet, check the link in the description and then come back here. So basically I made that video and I showed it to a few friends and a few of them said, you know, the video is really cool, but you know, could you explain a little bit about what we're actually seeing? Like what are the buildings, what are the different parts of the station? So I want to go through this video, you know, kind of piece by piece and just explain what we're looking at as you go through my rendering. And first of all, let me say that uh, I am not an expert on any one of these things. I haven't actually been down there. I'm just an enthusiast and I'm about to deploy down there soon. And I just thought it'd be helpful to explain these things. If anybody has more expertise than me, which is I'm sure a lot of people, please feel free to say so in the comments and correct me on anything I'm saying. So first building you see is the Skynet Ray Dome. Now a Ray Dome is basically just a globe that you see here, this white globe looking thing that covers a radar dish. This radar dish is the main uplink for data, the internet, etc., to a satellite. It's the station's main link to the outside world is this dome. It's not very fast. It's about 1.5 megabits per second. You know, most residential broadband in the US is probably about 10 times that, but it's in the middle of nowhere. It's a satellite link. That's the way it is. So that's the Skynet Ray Dome. Next, really quickly, you see us fly by the external cargo berms, and these are just big boxes of stuff that need to be stored that are okay to be frozen. So you can see they're out in the open. Um, these boxes freeze all the way through, and it's just storage for stuff that doesn't need to stay at room temperature. A little further up, you can see these kind of half circle, half cylinder buildings. Um, a lot of these are hypertats or hyper habitats, which are good for overflow housing. Um, haven't been used for a little bit because the main station has been able to house most people that it needs to, but they're also able to be used for uh, room temperature storage since they're made to be at room temperature for people. They can also be used for room temperature storage for stuff that shouldn't be frozen. And then very quickly, we kind of fly by the vehicle garage, vehicle workshop, and the power plant. We can see a little bit of smoke coming out of, which I spent a lot of time on, but then you, you know, it's so fast that you don't even notice it. So whatever. But these house all like the caterpillars, the snow plows, the, you know, bulldozers, that kind of thing. And then we get to the main station. Now, this is where everybody lives, eats, sleeps, plays ping pong, etc. This building is an absolute feat of engineering. If you think about it, it has to stay on its own in the coldest place on Earth. Uh, it has to have fail safes in case the power goes out. It has to be very well insulated. It has to be designed not to get buried in snow. Um, so it's, it's just got so many things about it that are just engineering marvels. And I'm not going to go into all of them because there's a thousand. But I want to point out two things that I find really interesting that you can see from the exterior. The first thing is if you look at the front of the building, it has this angle kind of cut into the front of it. It's a 30 degree angle that faces the prevailing winds. Now what the designers realize is that if they cut this angle into the front of the building, it funnels the wind underneath and by the Venturi effect, it actually helps blow the snow away and out from underneath the building so that snow doesn't build up and bury the building, which was a problem for the previous station at the South Pole. The second thing I want to point out is that the entire station is sitting on these supports. Now, no matter how well designed the angle and the Venturi effect works, snow is going to build up. So they had to design a way for the station to be elevated over time or lifted over time. So each one of these supports has a jack in it that can lift the station even higher and they can just basically add height to the station as the snow builds up and it, they found out that was going to add decades to the life of the station. So really, really cool. Now next we see a little flyby of the ceremonial South Pole. Now the true geographic South Pole is a little bit away away from this, but um, it moves every year. So it's hard to build uh, like a shrine or ceremonial thing around a marker that moves every year. So this is the kind of the accepted ceremonial South Pole. Um, around it are the 12 flags of the original signers of the Antarctic Treaty, which protects the Antarctic continent for research and peaceful purposes. I'm not going to list all 12 countries for you here, but feel free to look it up on your own. All right, after some more fancy flying and whooshiness, we come to the clean air sector. Now, the clean air sector is basically a giant kind of wedge of land that goes out from one of the corners of the station and continues on for like 100 miles like that. 
and it's upwind from the station, so you're not getting any of the exhaust or fumes from any of the power plant or whatever, or vehicles. So any air that is sampled in the clean air sector is pretty much clean with no you know, real sources of pollution within hundreds or thousands of miles even. Um, so this you know, is a great place to do atmospheric research, take air samples, and I don't know all the different experiments that happen there, but I do know that there's only a few places in the world where you can get air samples and be confident that it's not being tainted by a nearby source of pollution. So that's why this is important is because it's, there's no nearby source of pollution that's going to kind of skew the results. So it's kind of like a, almost like a worldwide average of what the atmosphere looks like. And then we head over to the dark sector. Uh, this was just this smoky, black smoky thing was just something I thought of for an effect. I wanted some way to transition to night and I was learning how to do smoke and blender and I just thought it'd be cool. So uh, first thing you notice is the auroras. Um, the southern lights are present there very often. Whether or not they look like this, I guess we'll find out. Directly inside here, we come to MAPO or the Martin A. Pomerantz Observatory. Uh, this has had couple different uses since it was completed years ago. Primary experiment, as far as I'm aware, is the Keck Array to study the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB. Now, the CMB in pop culture has been kind of termed the fingerprint of the Big Bang because as the universe has cooled, it's kind of like what's left over in the background. And studying it can give us some insights into the universe as it is now and how it was before. And as we fly by it, I kind of do this little flashy effect of the CMB kind of washing over the sky. And all right, next we quickly come up to the South Pole Telescope or the SPT. And this is a more recent construction. It's probably most famous for being part of the project that helped give us the first real image of a black hole in 2019, the South Pole Telescope along with I think seven other telescopes around the world kind of put their telescope power together to give us that black hole image. But now it also studies the cosmic microwave background of the CMB. And so we kind of fly off here to see a black hole because like I said, that's what the SPT was kind of famous for. And finally, we come to the ice cube neutrino detector. Now all the experiments and all the buildings at the South Pole are important and they're all really cool. I feel like the ice cube neutrino detector is the big one. And certainly by the amount of land it takes up and by the funding it requires, it is the biggest of all the experiments at the South Pole. A neutrino is a small subatomic particle that hardly ever, ever interacts with normal matter, like you, me, a tree, whatever. So the only way for us to detect it is to have a large tank of something, whether it's water or ice or whatever, and then when a neutrino interacts with, does interact with one of those things, like a water molecule or something, it lets off a little flash of light and we can set up basically light detectors to see when that happens and to analyze it. Now, other places in the world have big tanks of water, but what they found out is that since the South Pole Station is basically built on a mile of ice and this ice is so clear, that if we put light detectors down into it, we can use the ice itself as a giant neutrino detector. The big spidery orange glowy thing uh, is all of the cables that are running out and that's how big an area the detector takes up. They don't actually glow in real life. I made that up, but whatever, artistic license, okay? But then all the blue lights I put in, you know, going down from those detectors are all detectors in the ice. There are about 5,000 of them uh, and those are just sitting there watching, waiting for that little flash of light that a neutrino might have when it interacts with a molecule of ice slash water. And then all that data gets fed up into the building, gets refined, processed, and then studied by astronomers to make groundbreaking papers about neutrinos. And that is pretty much the video. Um, there are other experiments going on down there. I just got the bare highlights, but um, I just wanted to give some context. So thanks for watching. Subscribe if you like my channel. Um, I will be at the South Pole from February to November of 2021. I'm not sure how much I'll be able to upload while I'm there, but uh, yeah, stay tuned anyway.